Hi everyone, my name is Kong. Um, today, I will present our work on a new abstraction to study cache side channel. This is joint work with my collaborators listed on the screen. First, let me give a quick primer on the cache side channel. There are three facts about the cache that allows an attacker process to steal information from the victim process. First, accessing the cache changes the cache state. When a process accesses some data, the corresponding cache line will be brought from the memory to the cache, which could evict another cache line that belonged to another process. Second, accessing the cache also reveals the cache state. For a cache hit, the access is fast, but for a cache miss, the access is slow. Finally, in an attack scenario, the victim and the process, uh, an attacker run on the same machine and thus share the cache. As the victim process runs, it continuously accesses the cache, and thus changing the cache state. Meanwhile, the attacker continuously probes the cache state by accessing some data in its own address space and measuring the access time. They can therefore learn about the cache state and the, what the victim is doing. Here are two implementations of modular exponentiation, a subroutine sub commonly found in crypto libraries. Both program leaked encryption key. Let's see why. On the left hand side, the program iterates over every bit of the encryption key E. If the bit is one, the program enters the branch, which invokes multiply and a modular function, each of hundreds of lines long. This function encrypts a lot of cache activities with unique patterns. If the bit is zero, the program does nothing. An attacker can distinguish which branch is executed by monitoring cache, cache activity. On the right hand side, the encryption key is split into W0 to WN. Inside the program, WI is used to index into an array G. A different key will cause a different element to be accessed in G, therefore the attacker can learn the exact key by monitoring the cache. The type of leakage on the left is commonly called control flow leakage, and the one on the right is called memory access leakage. In addition, I will call if condition that uses secret as sensitive if conditions. Their corresponding branches will be called sensitive branches. Memory accesses that involve secrets will be called sensitive memory accesses. The side channel attack can be modeled in an information flow setting. The input, consisting of both secret input and public input, induces a memory access trace, which further induces a series of cache states, which further induces a series of observations by the attacker. To generalize the threat model, we make it agnostic to architecture and attacker's detail, and assume that attacker see the complete trace of memory accesses. And as is common in security research, we also assume that attacker knows the source code. The goal of our work is to quantify the amount of information leaked, and also to repair the program so they don't leak. To quantify leakage, we use an information theoretical measure called channel capacity. It is defined as a log two of the number of all possible observations. In our case, it is a log two of the number of possible memory access traces the program can induce. Prior work on mitigation has largely used the constant time programming paradigm, which looks out for specific patterns in a program. More specifically, it looks out for sensitive if conditions and sensitive memory accesses. Both FACT and Constantine are tools that compile leaking programs into constant time programs. These tools use different techniques to find the sensitive if condition and the sensitive array accesses in the program, as is highlighted in red. They then use different techniques to transform, uh, trans to transform away the leaking site. However, tools based on constant time program paradigm are only able to identify where the leak happens, but not how much the information is leaked. The abstraction does not contain enough information to quantify leakage. On the quantification side, previous work, including cache audit, use trace as the abstraction. We believe trace is also not a good abstraction to deal with cache side channels because they don't provide enough information for mitigation. Let's go back to this example. On the right hand side, you can see a list of all traces a program can produce. If two traces differ in one location, it is very hard to pinpoint which instruction in the source code causes the difference because different traces have different lengths. In other words, the traces lack structural information about the program which we need to fix the code. We therefore argue that trace is also not a good abstraction. In this work, we propose a novel abstraction differential set for analyzing cache side channels. It can be used to both quantify and mitigate leakage. We build an implementation DSA, which performs better than the baseline in both tasks. In the next few slides, I will informally explain what differential set is. We will use the running example on the left throughout the presentation. The program partitions the input array using the, using the other input pivot and store the result in the out array. It is very similar to the one used in quicksort. 
J0 and J1 are indexes that points to the beginning and the end of the out array, and they move towards center as the results are, ri are written to the out array. We provide two examples inputs and outputs on the right. Let's see what the trace looks like for these two inputs. As is highlighted in red, the two traces are different. Now, if we look at the traces horizontally and a group memory access into sets, each set represents all possible variations that can happen at this location in the trace. These sets coalesce the variation introduced by both control flow leakage and memory access leakage. We call each of these sets a local differential set, and they are used to patch the original program. How the patch works is that instead of accessing memory address directly, the program will access every element in the local differential set and choose which one to use inside the CPU core. We will discuss more about that later. Also, we use a simple example where the branches have the same length. We will show how to deal with more complex programs later. Now, still look at the trace, but to do it vertically. We obtain a set of all traces. We call this the global differential set of the program, and often shortened as differential set. It summarizes the variation on the entire traces that a program can induce. The size of the differential set gives us an upper bound on the leakage. So we also solve the problem of leakage quantification. In the next few slides, I will discuss how the differential set are computed. To simplify the discussion, we will use an unrolled version of the running example. As the first step, we will compute the access set for every memory access in the program. Access set is defined as a set of concrete memory addresses that a memory access instruction can reach. For example, out J0 on line 2 can only reach out 0 because 0's initial value is 0. So X access set will have one element, as is shown in the table. Next, we arrive at the most interesting step. We're going to align memory accesses across branches. We call the line memory access uh, the siblings as uh, they occur in relatively the same place in their respectively, respective branches. We will then merge their respective access set into what we call local differential set. Let's see how that works in, with the running example, where we focus on the first iteration of the loop. We also have a control flow graph of this code snippet. The obvious way to align memory accesses is to group the first two in zero into the sibling sets and merge their access sets into local differential sets. Next, we align out J0 and out J1 and merge their access set. We align the rest of the program and we arrive at this mapping from sibling sets to local differential set. Again, we cheated a little by using a simple example. We will discuss how to align more complicated programs later. Now, we claim that the mapping can be used to mitigate leakage, and I will show you how that is done. First, we harden every memory accessing instruction in the source code by touching every element in the local differential set. The exact mitigated code can't be fit on the slide, so they are highlighted in a different font. Now, let's see a concrete execution with the hardened program. See the program is now executing an access to out J0 on line 2. Instead of, instead of just accessing the address directly, the program will sequentially access the elements in the local differential set. Therefore, it will first access out zero, as the animation shown below, and store the data in a register inside the core. The program will now access the second element in the, in the differential set, as is shown in the animation. The result is stored in another register. Once all data are fetched, the program selects which one it really needs. Such choice happens inside the core, and is not seen by the attacker. What I show in the animation is a slightly simplified version of what really happens. I was describing the access to out J0 as if it is a read instruction, but it's actually a write instruction. So what really happened is that it, the, the program will iterate over the local differential set and load most addresses in the core. If the address is the address it intends to store to, it will do a store instruction rather than a load. Let's convince ourselves that the hardened program is now secure. Looking at the trace before, different input trace, different input induces different traces, which leak information. After mitigation, the program produced the same traces regardless of the input. What the attacker sees is a sequential access to the local differential sets, which they already know since they have the source code. We've seen how we can mitigate the leakage. A natural way to quantify the leakage is to take the Cartesian product of the local differential sets and count the size. 
If we do so, we estimate the leakage to be log 2 of 18. However, doing a simple Cartesian product will overcome the leakage. For example, the combination highlighted in red is impossible, as out 0 is accessed multiple times, which can't happen in an actual execution. We therefore refine the differential set by attaching the pass condition to every element in the local differential set. We can use the conjunction of pass condition to rule out impossible combinations. Using this new table, we are able to compute the set of traces, which has size 4, and we conclude that the program leaks two bits, which is indeed the ground truth leakage. Besides, we want to point out that the quantification, quantification test is compositional. Instead of counting the number of traces, we can instead count subtraces and multiply the leakage. Users therefore have a choice between precision and scalability. I'm not going to discuss branch alignment. The idea is simple. If two branches have different number of memory accesses, we pad no up memory access code holes to the shorter branch. This ensures that every pair of branches had the same number of memory accesses. And consequently, the program will produce traces of the same land. For the same program, there are many ways to align branches. A different alignment will result in a different differential set. Are they all valid? The answer is yes. We have a theorem that states, given a program S, regardless of how the, how the branches are aligned, the resulting differential set has its size strictly greater than the set of all possible memory traces, thus providing a sound estimate of leakage. Another natural question to ask is whether the different alignment are equally good. The answer is no, because sound alignment produces more efficient mitigations. Let's look at this example. The dam branch has two memory accesses, whereas the else branch has just one. There are two ways of lining branches. Each will produce a different local differential sets. The alignment on the right aligns similar memory accesses, which results in an overall smaller mitigation overhead. DSA is implemented using a series of softwares. You can find the details in the paper. Now, let's look at the evaluation, first on the quantification side. We use benchmarks from prior works, and DSA reports the ground truth leakage for all benchmarks we tested. In contrast, cache audit overestimated leakage for four out of 18 programs. On the mitigation side, we also use the benchmark from prior work Constantine. DSA reports uh, produce mitigated code with fewer memory footprint compared to the baseline Constantine. We found that out of all the leaking memory accesses across all the benchmarks we tested, DSA can mitigate 6.7% without touching the entire array, while Constantine touches the entire array to mitigate the leakage. Let's do some case study. First, on the quantification test. In this program, K, the secret, is used to index into array buff. However, even though the array is accessed in every iteration, the same K is used. Therefore, the program only leaks three bits, as K ranges from 0 to 7. However, cache audit is not able to reason about the correlated leakage like this, so it overestimates. In the second example, we have an outer branch that is not sensitive and an inner branch that is sensitive. Because of the control of the leakage from the inner branch, one bit is leaked. However, cache audit don't, don't, don't distinguish public and secret inputs and instead treat all inputs as secret. They therefore also overestimate. Now let's look at the case study on the mitigation. In this program, the variable i2 is indexed into an array. i2 is sensitive, but it can only take on 32 unique values because of the modular operation on the previous line. Therefore, DSA only needs to touch the first 32 elements whereas the Constantine needs to touch every element in the array. In conclusion, differential set offers a new abstraction for studying cache side channel. It is the first of such kind that can both quantify and mitigate leakage. It can be computed compositionally, which allows users to make strategic trade-off between precision and scalability while remaining sound. We hope it unifies advancement in cache side channel quantification and mitigation research in the future. That's it. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the audience? Uh, let me start us off. Um, so I'm curious, does, does the, the, the work seems very cool. Does it support programs that use pointers? 
Uh, well, we use uh, um, uh, a bonded model checker CBMC to turn a program into you know, formulas. So whatever CBMC does, we, we just carry from that. And uh, CBMC has some alias analysis inside, so we kind of just you know, carry over that. Awesome. Uh, thanks for the talk. I'm Kirby Linville. You'll see me in two talks. Um, uh, so for the for the mitigation piece, there's it, it sounds like you uh, fill up more of the registers. Whenever you run out of registers, how do you handle the the additional things that need to be added? Do you start spilling the memory, and if so, how do you avoid the same kinds of issues there? Good question. So. Um, Basically, we don't need to store every data in the register. We can just, because we, we, we just need to show to the attacker that we are loading things, right? If we don't need that data, we don't need to store that data. So what I show is kind of a, a simplification. Sometimes you just need to load the data. If it's not what you want, you can, don't need to store it. And also, I want to point out that we kind of inherit some mitigation strategy from prior work Constantine, where they use vector um, registers, which is a lot more efficient because you can load a lot of data at the same time and use vector operations to choose one data that you actually need. Um, so that's also a nice strategy to deal with this. Okay, thanks. All right, let's uh, thank the speaker again. and. Uh...